like to call to order the November 5 meeting of the Board Governance Committee. Carolyn, would you please call the roll? Ms. Ortega, representing the Director of Finance. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Ms. Zumont, representing the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Here. Let me see, that's only three. Who missing? Mr. Unterman is not here. Pardon? Would you like me to wait for the? No. Okay. No. There is one three? Okay. All right, well then, never mind. Chairperson McGuire, you do have a quorum. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and please let the record reflect that Ms. He Joy Hika and Dana Dillon uh, are present at the meeting. Thank you. Let's uh, begin with uh, agenda item one, approval of committee agenda. Is there a motion? Ms. Ortega, second. Ms. Hendricks, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, agenda item two, the self-evaluation policy. Uh, Ms. McDuffie, would you, you have some comments? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Amy McDuffie with the Fiduciary Services Practice of Hewitt and his Knupp. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to see all of you again. I wanted to provide some context for this item as well as the others that you have on your agenda today. And it stems from the 2013 offsite that we had, or that, that the board had, I should say. Not this past one, but the one prior to that. And at the time, there was a sentiment from the board that the board policy manual seemed to be a bit voluminous and that at times it was challenging from a readability standpoint. And so as a result of that, it, it directed the, the governance, the board governance committee to take up this matter. And at the end of the last fiscal year, the committee directed uh, Nancy Williams and myself to review the policy manual to ensure that it was still aligned with contemporary best practices and of course the direction that was initially intended by the board. And at the time when we conducted our review, uh, we had shared with you that we found the board policy manual to be in, in good shape. We recommended a few modifications or tweaks to it, and that essentially uh, was reviewed by the committee. It adopted some of the recommendations, and that formed the basis for your work plan this year. So the items that you're seeing in front of you on the agenda today are all uh, as a result of that review. Specifically with respect to item number two, the self-evaluation policy, that was one of the first recommendations that we had made because the board has been engaging in the process of conducting a self-evaluation for a number of years. It just didn't have a policy that, uh, that supported that, that practice, which we consider to be a best practice. So we've provided a draft for the committee's review and discussion today, and ultimately we'd be looking for the committee to make a recommendation to the board to adopt a self-evaluation policy with any amendments that the committee determines today would be needed. Uh, so this would be item two, the attachment, uh, board governance pages four and five. Just as a special note, there is some header cleanup that we would need to do prior to a, a final version of this. The third header says method and evaluation criteria. It should just say method. And the header on the top of page five should just say evaluation criteria. So with that, I thought I would open it up for discussion. This should look familiar to the committee members after just engaging in this practice last month. Uh, again, just codifying the existing practice that the board has been engaging in over the last number of years. So, Mr. Chair, happy to take any questions. All right, Ms. Ms. Hendricks. So, Amy, the so board governance four and five is the pol is the so board self evaluation policy, Correct. right? Correct. That would be the policy we are proposing. And my understanding is, in two thousand thirteen, at our offsite, the board determined because the self evaluation is where, <laughs> this is gonna sound right out of it, this is where we look at ourselves and say, how are we doing as a board interacting with each other, 
that kind of stuff, right? Correct. Not the evaluations and the other things that we do at an offsite. Correct. The focus is on us looking at ourselves as how we function as a board. So in 2013 at our offsite, we decided to do that every other year, or at least at that meeting, we decided to not do those because we didn't do a board self evaluation this year, I and actually, the plan was. Uh, let me let me uh, jump in and provide some detail. So that we know moving forward, like for next year. Sure, and the direction that that we received at the time was to continue that the board would continue to practice, which in fact, if you look at the agenda from the prior offsite that you were just participating in last month, there was a segment called board self-evaluation. It was just that it was a little less formal than you right. typically would engage in. Right. And so we designed this policy so that it supported the annual practice of, okay. of conducting a self-evaluation because we do consider that to be a best practice. What we did, though, is allow some flexibility right. to have it either be formal, formal or informal Got and to, to rotate it so that it best suits the needs of the board at the time. And it does, uh, Sharon, it does say on the, uh, underneath the method criteria, it does say the evaluation survey, the formal one will be used uh, at least every other year so that reflects yeah. some of your flexibility. So in reading this policy, then it would dictate that next year at our 2015 offsite, we would do a formal evaluation, yes. board evaluation. And if that's the same, the exact same formal process in terms of a survey that you've used in the past, that can be the case. Or you may um, just want to introduce another modification like um, having board member interviews to generate uh, the messages that you want to talk about during that time. So it's not too prescriptive, but it is suggesting that every other year there's a formal process that's used. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments by board members? Uh, this says first reading, but we can make it an action item. I think it's a fairly straightforward policy. Um, so I would entertain a motion. Ms. Ortega moved to approve this item. Second, Second by Ms. Hendricks. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to, uh, as we put that, I'm going to let the motion reflect that that's with incorporating the changes that were I should have, I should have uh, yeah. raised that as an issue. Yes, please incorporate those changes. Is that fine by everyone? Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item three, which is also an action item. Review proposed legislation potentially impacting the education policy. So, uh, Jill, are you or Amy going to speak first? Uh, uh, Jill's going to speak. I was just going to uh, introduce it a little bit only because, unlike the other items that are before you, this did not come out of the offsite. This actually came out of a uh, from a suggestion, I believe, by the treasurer's office uh, and the controller's office to try to harmonize what was going on with. Uh, the requirements that were being uh, addressed at CalPERS through legislation. And so that's the genesis of this, un un unlike the other items that are before you. Okay. Sure. As, and as Mr. Barto said, that um, there was an inquiry from one of our board members about some recent legislation. It was AB 1163. It's going to be codified as um, Government Code 2100. And there's some new requirements for the CalPERS board. It does not apply to the CalSTRS, um, but it was specific to CalPERS. And um, we took a look at the main requirements of that legislation and also looked at our education policy um, and sort of did a comparison. And at a high level, there were, um, there were two main components that stood out to us. One was um, there are, in that new legislation, there are some uh, requirements that the education policy for CalPERS list um, topics for board education. And then another one of the main requirements um, is that there is now an hour, uh, minimum hour requirement. So um, every two years, the board members have to complete 24 hours of uh, continuing education. So basically breaks down to 12 hours a year. So we looked at our policy, and um, our policy as it is is very comprehensive. It's, um, it's pretty robust and it um, does include a lot of elements that 
um, would be seen uh, reflected by the legislation that affects the CalPERS education policy now. So for instance, we have fiduciary um, training and ethics training, and um, there are many other in-house opportunities for training that um, occur. For example, I believe at the last offsite, there was some substantial, I think, sustainability training done. So, um, so there are lots of opportunities for training, and our policy um, covers a lot of different elements of, of those topics. The one thing our policy does not have is an hourly requirement. So um, we also took a look at some of the policies of other um, pension funds and um, looked at what they require. And it, honestly, there's quite a spread. Um, there's some, there are some um, plans that require, you know, no particular hour requirement, but do have educational um, requirements. And then there are plans, I believe, I talked to Amy and she said there's one plan that requires 32 hours a year. So I think they range from seven hours to 32 hours. So um, there's quite a spread there. And um, it, it really, I think, discussing this item is just, um, depends on what the committee decides um, is appropriate for our policy, whether or not we do want to change anything, whether or not um, you know, we, our policy as it, as it is is fine, or whether or not we want to um, sort of get ahead of the game because there may be a potential that legislation would also eventually affect CalSTRS. And um, so with that, I will, I will open it up if anybody has any questions about this policy. Ms. Hendricks? So I had a couple questions. I think I've kind of talked to Amy a little bit. Um, I mean, ob the ob first obvious question is just, you know, anytime something's mandatory, I think there's just sort of a natural, I don't know, the re rebel in me goes, don't make me do anything. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things I'm, I've been interested in since I've become a board member is this idea of how do you educate board members. And I think Joy and I were just chatting today that, you know, each person who comes on our board comes from a different angle, from a different, you know, background, whether that's their occupation or how they got to the board. Is it? So I think that's something that I know I'd love Jack and other folks to be thinking about is, is there a way we could, um, I know we have like a standard orientation mm -hmm. where, but I remember doing that and it's like drinking from a fire hose for four hours and I just don't learn well that way. I mean, it's great just to kind of get the nomenclature a little bit, but, um, but I would love for us to think about a little bit more of a, you know, sort of a specialized, if there's tracks or something that we could think about for board education. If we do decide to do a 24 hour mandatory training, um, or mandatory education that maybe there's um, ways that board members could um, maybe under topics or something that we could generate some more educational opportunities that will kind of scratch people where they're itching in terms of because I know when I came on I was like I want to learn about finance I want to learn about Chris Ailman's world and so what can I do to learn about that um, but I think other board members might have different so I think that might be something we could do with the the you know the board website or something with our education piece is maybe because right now it's just kind of generic but maybe we could have topics or specializations and there's tons of education out there so it's just a matter of maybe doing some of that so that was just kind of input I think the question I had was um, you know about cost I know you know we have an education item here and I don't I was wondering at Calpers or other systems if we have a 24-hour requirement for over two years for each board member, I would assume the cost of our education, I know I'm one of those that uses that quite a bit because <laughs> I travel a lot, but um, I would imagine the cost of our, our board education would change. And so does CalPERS have a dollar limit on board education or how do different institutional investors treat board education in terms of the cost? You know, I'd, uh, I'll just weigh in my own, from my own experience, and Amy, I know if you looked at a lot of other pension systems, there's not consistency for sure. Some have actually right. used a quota per person approach, number of trips per person. But, but there are problems. You know, I think when we set up the budget, we decided not to have that kind of to an individual dollar attachment because, right. frankly, it's the point you just made, Sharon, which is 
some people have a long road of education, some a shorter road. So to say that you only get $5,000 every 24 months, that's it, ceiling. You know, I think that you don't want to put rigid caps on someone's fiduciary learning. That So that's why the board did not do that. Right. And they tried to set a budget that was adequate to just really embrace the needs of the board. Um, Till now, it's been adequate over the years. Right. There's been a couple of years where I think oh, only one year probably yeah, where it actually exceeded. In my time, we've never maxed it out. Yeah, but, but I think I, I think this probably will speak to changes in it. So really, um, you know, it's not. I, I think the board only um, we set the dollar limit to be responsible uh, right. guardians sure. of money and making sure that we we watch that carefully. But I, I think you'll want to revisit the dollar amount if you've got twelve times twenty four times X. Um, that would be using those funds. So I would encourage uh, you all to think about that when we do the budget and see how we do in the coming year. I agree, uh, but I wouldn't. I would. I would. I. I'd be my counsel not to go to more detail in budgeting per person. I just. No, I, I don't like I that approach. Completely. I completely. I would agree with that. I. I think I feel some some sheepish sometimes because I feel like I do some more traveling or do more education sometimes than other folks do, and I know some of that leads into my next question, which is. Sometimes when I'm asked to go, and Jackie and I have talked about this, when I go get asked to speak somewhere, mm -hmm. that actually oftentimes, because CalSTRS is such a great, you know, CalSTRS pays for me to go speak somewhere, but that's not really my education. That's right. usually me educating teachers about retirement or something. But that tends to come out of this budget. Mm. And so I think I feel kind of, not that we've ever hit our limit at this point, the 60000 but um, I have felt a little awkward about that because I do feel like that's board education should be for board education. So I just wonder if there's some change we can make so that sure. when board members travel for the sake of um, speaking or something where we're educating others or something that could be in a different category or a different fund because I think yeah, I felt a little you know I'm not sure I, I can't say that it's actually a pure scheme what what that as that budget morphed from the board's sure. desires was more I, I would have I guess a proper labeling would be uh, board education slash out-of-state travel because clearly within California we don't track those expenses we track them of course we track them but we don't track them within that budget um, we just that's part of the uh, a broader budget for the board um, so, um, you know, I think in the, in the interest of transparency, that became a way of showing the cost of the board for outside travel, but that's your, absolutely your call, how you want to divide those pots, uh, around that. If you, uh, you know, uh, you know, Chris and I make a lot of speeches, um, to outside organizations and you're, you know, you're making the speech for one hour, then you're sitting in for four presentations, maybe to hear something and learn yourself. Is it a speech? Is it an education? I, I don't know. But I, I defer that. to you. I just kind of, that's sort of my, I just feel, again, if we're going to move in this direction, I just think it feels helpful to, to separate those out because, so I guess we can work on that. But that's just. It's really fine. We, we had a former board member who's actually on the board right now that really championed the, the dollar counting and how we display it each month and everything. And, and it, that's the current structure reflects his advocacy around that approach. So I don't think you should feel wedded to it. I don't want to dominate all the questions, but I also would ask the chairs um, your permission. It sounds like we have some folks in the back that um, have to leave soon, and I think is is somebody I can't actually read this. Ter Terry actually has it. Is it your? Okay, you go stole ahead. My phone no, there. no, I just I I was given this note address. Okay, so go ahead. Go. All right. <laughs> you go, Mr. Chair, and then we'll get back to our questions. All right, we'll do it now. I'd like to. Um, recognize uh, some visitors from Stanislaus County who are in the audience today. I think we have, I'm not sure if it's eight or 10 CTA and NEA retired members from Stanislaus County in the audience. And we'd like to recognize your presence and thank you for attending this meeting. <laughs> We're looking out for your retirement. There you go. I guess we have to leave. Thank anyway. you, Terry. Thank right. you, Terry. <laughs> Sharon, are you? Finished? Um, is there? I can come back to my questions. Actually, I'll. No, won't you? Won't you, you do you want me to go through them? Okay, I just you know. I got a few. Um. Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. So that was that one, and. 
Oh, and I did. I just there was a note. I, I think um, having Joy join our board has made me think a lot about what I was like as a new board member. And the the item on on board governance fourteen about industri industry periodicals. I just think it's important for, I don't know if you even know this, Joy, but for new members, you know, I subscribe now to the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, I mean, my, my, I look like a homeless person at home with all my <laughs> newspapers um, stacked up, but I think that's an important thing um, in terms of board education. I know that I learn a lot and I send Chris articles all the time. Can you believe what they're doing in private equity, Chris? Um, from things that I read on the weekends in the New York Times and the business section and things like that. So I, I do think that um, I know in terms of being current um, on the issues that, that face us as institutional investors um, is a really important thing for board members to know. And you can talk to Mary and she will connect you with that. And then I think, I think that's it. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Um. All right, I think Mr. Elman would like to make a comment. No, I was just going to add, um, right now, uh, a lot of the periodicals, and we probably should be surveying you, but I don't know we're that good at it, when the subscriptions come up like to The Economist. Alan Emkin once recommended that you all get The Economist. Um, well, so... <laughs> um, the, uh, we picked that up as part of the expense in the investment branch. We didn't, it does not build to the, the board. Um, but there's no, it just happened that way. So I think it'd be good to have a policy. And I think, you know, I know from our perspective, we would like to have you getting pension and investment age, The Economist, and and Barron's or the Wall Street Journal, at least, you know, that, at least the digital access to the Wall Street Journal. We don't buy many journals ourselves, but I think that would be valuable for you to stay educated and aware. And I'd love to see that either in a policy or at least an informal process. And I don't care which budget it falls in, but I think that's a good a good place to go. I think it's um, I think it's a great suggestion, and it's already incorporated in your policy on that in that last paragraph on fourteen. Uh, but your CEO should be maintaining a robust list of those periodicals, so you might want to get that information to Jack so he can provide yeah. that to the. Board members, but it does clearly say that the. Because I yes. read the Financial Times because I'm really interested in the global piece, and sometimes even the you know Wall Street Journal, you know I I just like the F, the Financial Times kind of gives a different perspective. So I the, every board member can have a different appetite, but I think it's helpful to know what what our options are. For uh, ab sure. Absolutely, and your current policy does reflect that those periodicals will be. Uh, will be paid for by the system, recognizing that your desire to maintain your educational standards. And again, I, I do think that Chris's suggestion is an excellent one to, to uh, engage with the board members, the board as a whole, and the board members, and also make suggestions as to what should be on that list. So I do think that that should be a robust interactive process. And that is supported by your policy. Thank you. All right, Mr. Boykin. Thank you. I just want to preface my comments by saying that Treasurer, you know, prior to this legislation, thought that CalPERS and CalSTRS had pretty good education policies, especially here where we're very transparent about the dollars we spend in budget and reporting out you know, what, what's been approved. And then the list that Jack maintains to you know, vetted conferences and opportunities. And then the, the fact that travel reimbursement is... is um, depends on the member turning in their evaluation. I think there's a lot that we do right. But I think the treasurer was kind of thinking strategically and asking this committee to think about consistency with um, the law that CalPERS is now subject to. Um, and then the one, well, couple of points, and I thought of this as Sharon was, I think my microphone is not on. Yeah, I accidentally turned you off. <laughs> <Accent. laughs> <laughs> Uranus is on, but I could probably <laughs> say it. Got it. Grant, Thank you're you. back up, and Uranus put it back in. As Sharon was speaking, one of the things that occurred to me is we tend to think of tra of education as travel, but there's, you know, if we could look for webinars and more in-house things that could capture us all at once during a board meeting week, I think that'd be beneficial. Um, 
The other thing, the issue that I thought of is CalPERS, and I think rightly so, has interpreted the law uh, as defining board member as board members and for ex officios as their designees. And I think there's attorney general opinions, not exactly on that point, but the, the rights and responsibilities of, of the member transfer to the designee. And so I, you know, I almost hate to bring it up as a designee, but I think it's something, if we're going to have requirements for board members, it should be for designees as well. And that's why I like the ideas of finding other opportunities that are not just travel. I think of Irena's case where the director of finance you know, um, doesn't generally sit at our meetings. Irena, who is on, probably, I'll probably get this wrong, but 70 plus boards, commissions, um, has a you know, pretty tough schedule to work in other things. But um, I, I do think that that's something that we need to think about. Maybe it's implied in board member, but I think our office would be happier to see it say, and designees. So. I think that's an excellent point. I just wanted to add that I know uh, management, uh, Jack and others are in, working certainly with me and uh, outside counsel to put some of your mandatory internal training on uh, video so that designees could access. So for example, the, the um, uh, Bagley Keen fiduciary training to put that on video. So just for, for that reason, so that folks who are not here or designees can uh, also participate in that training. So um, I, we, I think that's an excellent suggestion. And I know that we'll follow up on that. Dana and Irena, would you request to speak again if you want to? All right, Irena. My question: I, I, I am supportive of the policy change as well. I think I think this is good, and I agree with um, Grant that it be clear that it transfers to the designees. I want to just make sure that we're really clear on that in the policy because there are two places where the policy actually refers specifically to the designee, the orientation and the ethics. And so when I read it, then it raises the question, well, does the 24 hours not apply since it doesn't specifically call out the designee as those other two do? So mm -hmm. just as you look at the policy, I think think about whether there should be one statement that says what, what we mean or some way to make that very clear. Dana? So um, I have several things. Some have come up during the discussion, but um, I'll hit on what we just finished with. Um, I, too, picked up on that there were some areas of our policy that are very direct on who it uh, pertains to, board members and their designated representatives. So um, I, I, I'm to hit really quickly on Arena's um, comments about the 24 hours, is it 24 hours per designee, 24 hours per ex officio office? I mean, that, that just kind of, that, that might be a lot of training for a lot of people, and I just think we need to consider that. Um, I think, too, that when we have ex officio um, constitutional officers on our board, it could possibly be very difficult for them to attain the same type of training or opportunities that are available to us when our focus is the board or the designee is focused on this board. And so, I mean, I, I, it's in our policy already, but I don't know if we've had every constitutional officer here for our fiduciary training, so I think that we need to think about that. Not um, everyone, but close. But but uh, it, it, yeah. But some have done it. For well, and and I, sure. and I would imagine that for some of their responsibilities, that yeah. they go through the state ethics and and yeah. trainings like that. So maybe we take a look at what could be cross. Yeah, I did, or whatever. and I did check with Calpers just last night just to make sure I I knew what they were doing and 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 as they right on your point. Um, they were relying on multimedia and other things to, to fill in right, for right, the right. constitutional officers. And so to that end, um, when we talk about, we talk about um, out-of-state educational opportunities, we talk about in-house education sessions, and then we talk about um, conferences. 
So I, I, I would like to throw in opportunities also in there because I'm thinking that we might do in-house sessions and there might be an opportunity that might be in-state but is not necessarily a session and it's not a conference or even maybe taking it to the point where we might have one-on-one -on -one with investment staff if there's something that we think that we need to dive deeper into could that possibly be considered it? So it's an opportunity also. Yeah. Um, but then I think you're saying with sport education, do you know what I mean? But, 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 if yeah. it, but, it, but I think sitting down with our investment staff yeah. and being more in, yeah. you know, educated on that asset class has got to, I mean, right. that seems like that would be a no-brainer. A um, couple more things. Uh, I'm struggling with just the language that was in the legislation and then moving that language into our policy. So it talks about the first two years you're on the board, you've got to do this, and then every subsequent two years you've got to do this. Why don't we just say within every two-year period, once you're elected to the board, you have to, serve, you have to put in this much time. It's the same amount of hours. It's the same type of educational requirements there's a little we've, we've delineated a little differently but it seems strange to have two years for when you're first on the board and then two years for every year after that it's just every two years trying to keep our policy maybe simple and then Brian I'd, I'd like you to explain to me and, and maybe it's not Brian it, it, it's someone else prorating the time of service if, in the event that a board member doesn't serve the full two-year intervals. I don't understand how that pro, how that's going to be prorated to reflect the actual time of service. It, yeah, and the reason that was put in there obviously is because there will be times when, you know, there won't. It'll be an uneven period of time or something like that. And, you know, I suppose we would just take it based on the time period you know, of that two years that, um, of training and. Um, if you change, if you make the change you suggested mm -hmm. for two years, then it doesn't become that much of an issue. This I think was meant mm -hmm. to address people who are appointed midterm. And, uh, and then so if you have a requirement within the first two years that someone, uh, and then every two years after, you're trying to tie that up to the terms on the board. So it's not necessarily, say, one of the constitutional officers has a new designee. The designee goes through the orientation. Mm -hmm. um, but then that might not be a full 24 hours. And so they, they need to think about within the next two years that they're going to be sitting on the board. They need to pick up some more training. But, yes. if, they're, mm -hmm. but if they leave before that two years is over, we're not going to say you didn't come, finish. Come I mean, back. I, and, yeah. I, I just I, I, said I, I think you what are we going to do? I, I, I yeah. just didn't understand. Well, that's why once you make the editorial change at the, of two years and you put it within the context of that two years of me. service, yeah. then yeah. thanks. And then it's not confusing for us. And the reason it was broken up that way, as far as new members and then sort of continuing members, um, is that's the way the a policy is currently worded. Um, there is a break, and then um, okay. Yeah, for the first year, there's certain training it was for the first, first year, year. second year. So, yeah. that, so it was meant to sort of streamline it by going with our existing language, but just, you know, at contributing to that. Um, and then there was a slight difference in um, the topic of, of education in the first two there years. Was, I, yeah, I noticed that. So that, that was the reason that they were separated. But, um, you know, if, that, if, if it, the committee would prefer that it be combined just to make it simpler, that, that is feasible, too. Alrighty, and then um, had to have one more thing, and now I can't remember what it was. I'll come back to it if I remember. Oh, orientation. Did you? Oh, good. Our mic's still on. Uh, Amy, you know we've talked every once in a while in in our offsites about having a refresher orientation. Um, can we take a look at that again, maybe for a suggestion, what, for us to have a conversation at our next offsite? Sure. About would that be beneficial? And then, Jack, um, we've talked about the periodicals. And could you just remind us, maybe on an annual basis, 
what's available to us so we don't forget. Yeah, for Thank sure. Thank you. All right, I'm done. Thanks, Terry. Ms. Hendricks. So, and I just wondered, since, you know, we're talking about this right now, could we just send that out, you know, this week or something, since we're talking about it? It just seems timely, and um, so folks can decide what they want to read. Um, my question was, again, about the, so the 24 hours, how are we counting that? So if you go to CII and, you know, it's a six-hour session and then eight-hour, I mean, is it like that? Or how do we... Right. Account it's, for the twenty-four. The way hours. the policy is, is written is um, it's it is self-reporting. I mean, you're going to be tracking your own, and um, and so yeah, if you if you attend a conference and there's six hours that you attend in one day, then you know just mark that down, and um, eight hours the next day, then mark that down. Um, that's something we should add to when, when we're doing um, our evaluations afterwards, mm -hmm. if we. You know, if we adopt this policy to include the number of hours or something like that, that might be a good way to track it. Because I, I appreciate, you know, the comments about I mean, Mary doesn't send us out a reimbursement check till we get that evaluation. I got them done this week. So um, so I think that's a good accountability measure um, for us. And that might be a good way to just put the number mm -hmm. of hours there. Um, and I guess so that's the accountability or that's the uh, that was my question. How do we measure or how do we, you know track board members compliance. you know education yeah like and the, that's the and, compliance and, yeah and the way it's worded is broad so that it's i mean for instance for the state bar we do self-reporting we you know go to conferences and that sort of thing for continuing education is meant to sort of mimic that um so that you know you would document or at least have an idea of what your hours are if um there was a reason why we needed to you know request those hours or documentation of that um, you know, we would ask that that be available. Because I, I would, I just sort of, because I, you know, I'm an educator, so I love education. And so as a, a board member, I, I did sort of, you know, I've looked at other institutional investors' education sites because I have friends on Lucera and CalPERS, and so I'm always kind of looking. And, and so I, I do think it would be great to maybe refresh and kind of maybe look. We have a lot of, I know for me now, I've been on the board three years, and so there's stuff that a lot of us have gone to a couple times. So I'm trying to broaden my, um, you know, kind of experience. Um, and so I wonder if there's a way we could kind of just um, broaden our education opportunities in this time since we're talking about this. So anyway, that's all I got. All right, we'll go back to Ms. Dillon. So, Jack, when we were talking earlier about the budget and how we delineate the budget if we're invited to be a speaker and um, how that all works, you know, I, I think I lean where you were talking that inevitably if I'm asked to serve on, say, like the NCTR's Ledge Committee, that's not necessarily an, an educational opportunity for me, but I've been asked to serve in a, my capacity as a trustee here on that committee, but I always learn something from the other trustees that are on that. So I've, I'm pretty comfortable with the budget side of that coming out of, because I do believe it's an educational opportunity on us, even though that's not the initial, or, you know, the driver that has brought us to that opportunity or whatever. So I wanted to throw that out too. Dana, are you finished? I'm done, thanks. Joy? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, underscore um, Sharon's comment that, um, you know, Jack, when I've looked on the, um, the board site at the educational opportunities, um, you know, I think that there are some of the bigger conferences and mm -hmm. educational sessions that are available that are focused, um, you know, for trustees. And th those look like real quality sessions, but I think if there are other opportunities, even, um, you know, webinars that Grant mentioned, other mm -hmm. types of educational opportunities that, um, you know, we could um, share with the board, um, you know, that might, I think, help, um, okay. you know, in terms of both meeting the requirement as well as, you know, for those of us who have, um, you know, other commitments where yeah. it might be harder to free up the, the several days to go to a conference. Yeah, and actually CI is a great example. They're, they're almost up to, I think, almost a weekly webinar now. They're, yeah. They've gotten so, and it's been very effective. Uh, and we've got a it series does this as well and a few others, um, but right there, that's a, quick and easy way of doing it. So we'll we'll work harder at that then. Yeah. 
There and also, you know, I would say that, I, sorry, that list actually is a very mainstream list for the most part of proven quantities over the year of the NCTRs, the film CIIs, but I'm not sure it um, embraces some of the boutique events, for lack of a better word, that tend to be sometimes topical focus, which, you know, after, after you've done this a while, the, sometimes the mainstream conference isn't really broadening your knowledge, and you do like like the more boutique-oriented, uh, whether it's about sustainability or emerging managers or something like that. And I think I think we could do a better job of finding those out for you. So, And some of those are better quality because they dig deeper into a topic rather than 10 topics that are thin. Yep. You know, you're going to something that fills in something. Yeah, that'd be great. Mr. Uh, Chair, I was just going to add one comment about a practice that we see with some other boards in terms of a development plan, and that was discussed today. And having a, the broad range of topics represented when you're a new trustee so that you can sort of self-select into how do I want to grow over the next two years. That might be instructive to have on file for each trustee so that the CEO would know which topics would be of interest to uh, different segments of, of the board. It could be something that's worthy of consideration as you think about this policy. I was thinking too that I Chair? I was thinking too that I, um, I think recently came across an educational item that I sent to Jack and said, you know, you might want to share this with the board or put it on the board education side. And so I think that's something we could, I certainly could do more of because I do get emails here and there of things and to share things that other board members might be interested in. I will say, you know, and I think with Joy, we've talked about this, that, you know, there are definitely certain ones that you get more <laughs> bang for your buck, if you will, um, in terms of actual education, some some more than others. And so I do think it's helpful with word of mouth <laughs> to, to be able to say, um, you know, this one was more beneficial than, than the others. But I'll, I'll send, Jack, I'll send you those and we can okay. add those to the board, board site. Any further comments, board members? Well, I think uh, that was a lively discussion on education. Uh, I, I sense, even though this is an action item, I sense that there were sufficient comments and uh, suggestions that were communicated that we should have this come back to, at the April meeting. I sort of have a question as to whether staff has any questions on you're probably going to have to listen to the transcript again in order to <laughs> yes. catch everything. But um, I do, I, I, I agree, and I, and I heard, that this is great, actually. I, it was really nice to hear, and we are certainly would get together with, uh, with, with staff here, with your consultant, and because uh, we're really now addressing the policy as a whole. We brought you a very small change, and if I could just, if you just indulge me for just a second and at least get a sense of if we... If with all the other changes that you suggested, if we put in a 24-hour over two-year requirement, is that something that uh, that we can bring back to you? Because that was that was that was just the one piece from the legislation, and then we we got other robust suggestions. Okay. Well, we'll we will work hard and bring that back to you uh, in February. I believe is your next meeting. Okay. No, it's April. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, any other comments? Oh, Ms. Dillon? So going back to Jill's comment, because we have um, asked for something different maybe for those first couple years, even though it's all going to get wrapped up into every two years, you can just <clears throat> ask for a focus on whatever it is that we've asked for in those first two years within that same delineation of the... Okay. Every two years. We'll, we'll engineer it that way. Thank you. Ms. Hendricks? My apologies, Mr. Chair, for speaking without pressing my button. No. Um, I was just, so the dollar amount, there's not a dollar amount included in the CalPERS legislation. So no, not, do we not know how they handle that in terms of budget? And I'm not sure how so, they've handled that okay. with their travel budget or education budget. That would just budget. be something I'd be curious as we come back yeah. to it. I think they'll... It, I know it's a policy, and that would be more of a, I don't know what we'll call that, but but it seems like that's, yeah. Yeah. we'd have I can, to talk I about can look budget. Into that. Yeah, I know the origins of the 60, but it, but it's a stale number. Uh, right, but no. we, the origins of the 60 was 5 times 12, because uh, because when we looked at other policies around the country, to the extent it was quota-based, 
it was around five. Got it. So it was it was that simple, five times twelve, and then we watched the budget of the board over time, and you you haven't yeah. used it, so we just left it alone. But you know, I you know, Mr. Boykin, just to <clears throat> answer your question, there's not a budget per se, but the approval process is similar to as it is here. Where yeah, mm -hmm. you well, they have a lot more assets than we have, so you know, a little different there. But uh, all right, we'll see. <laughs> Seeing no further requests to speak, I think staff has guidance to bring this back in April. Uh, we'll all look forward to that. Thank you. Let's move on to item four, which is a consent action item, approval of minutes of the June 5th, 2014 Board Governance Committee meeting, open session. Um, entertain a motion. Ms. Ortega, move approval. Seconded by Ms. Hendricks. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item five is an information item, review committee charter and scope of authority. First reading. Thank you. Um, this item also came out of, uh, I suppose, that the offsite that Amy spoke of um, to increase the readability and the, um, the consistency of the board policy manual. And, um, and so what is, what is basically on the table is just um, looking at the charter and there's specific authority um, with regard to sections 500, 600, and 700, making revisions to those sections of the board policy manual. And um, this, is, uh, this proposed revision is to expand that, not to substantively change um, other sections of the board policy manual, but just to allow flexibility for the committee to uh, make changes as far as you know, formatting, um, consistency, that sort of thing with the remainder of the board policy manual. And with that, I'll take questions. Anything to add? Well, I, I would like to add that uh, the idea, the general idea is that you wouldn't be, as a committee, jeopardizing the ownership of the substance of policies that naturally reside within the purview of other committees. This would, again, uh, I, the simple analogy I like to use is that you built a house, you added on a room and another room and another room and another room because you needed to address policies over time. And now, you know, th the idea would be going back through each of the rooms and ensuring that the baseboards all match and the paint is all the same consistent co uh, color. And again, just bringing it to having one voice instead of many voices that have been contributing over time. Um, if that would be something that sounds good from a priority standpoint, then having one committee own the formatting and readability and substance could potentially work as an option. I, I just want to uh, just to add to that another point of clarification is that board governance would not be a necessary stop on a policy change. So if there is a committee that wanted to make a policy change, either recommend it to the board or if they had the authority to make that change, that board governance would not be a necessary stop. It's not, it's not intended to be a procedural impediment it's just a, intended to give the committee the authority to say okay you pass this policy now let's go make sure that you know it all fits within the within the, um, the board policy manual when we have our consultant review uh, the policy manual and, and give an overview we can you have the authority to go in there and move headings and change things like that and so I just wanted to make that clear that we're not trying to impose a procedural hurdle on the uh, already efficient operations of the board and its committees. That's a good point. All right, this is an information item. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions at this time. Ms. Dillon. So Brian, if, if we don't have any objection to the wording that we've inserted in the policy, we could move that now, couldn't we? Yes, you could. Thank you. I can't do it. I'm not on the committee. <laughs> Ms. Hendricks? That was going to be my very question. So we can move this to an action item, and I would move approval of the uh, committee charter and scope of authority. 
All right, we have a motion by Ms. Hendricks. Second, Ms. Ortega. Uh, any questions on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I'm not supposed to vote. Opposed, either. please. <laughs> Those opposed, please say no. <laughs> the motion passes to uh, to approve uh, the recommended changes to the committee charter and scope of authority at this first reading. Thank you. All right, agenda item six is also an information item. Uh, it's a first reading. I don't know what we'll end up doing with it this time. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit different. It's a tricky one, I think. Compensation policy and procedure, first reading. Um, Amy, you have some comments? Certainly, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a tricky one. I would agree with you there, but it's also an, ex an excellent example of what we just discussed in terms of a structural or formatting change, because there's certainly nothing wrong with the substance that is currently in the, uh, the compensation policy for desig designated executive management and investment staff. I believe I got that correct. So <clears throat> the, the uh, ask that we have today is for the committee not to look at the substance of the two-page policy that's in front of you, but rather consider the concept of restructuring. And this was a result of a conversation that we had back in April uh, where we asked whether the committee would want to entertain pulling out the high level strategic goals of the board that was within its governance responsibility and separate that from the implementation detail that would rightfully belong in management level responsibility. And so to address that, we have really two parts. And one, of course, is in front of you and that's a draft policy that identifies the high-level responsibilities and the aims, if you will, of this compensation plan and what the board would like for it to be. It identifies key time frames and parameters for how the board makes its decisions. Um, and so that is intended to be the long-lasting framework that guides the compensation plan over the years. Part B would be to take the existing policy as it looks today, uh, it's 49 pages, not that I counted, but I did, uh, and, and take that and house it somewhere else within the organization where it's still safe in terms of the jurisdiction of the board so that any changes to it would require board action. Now, some of the discussions that we had with staff around, well, where does that go? Where would that existing policy go? And the, the place where we landed was actually to call it a plan document. And that's the suggestion that I wanted to offer up to you today, is to, in fact, just convert it to a plan document. And as I uh, was working on this, and I went back to the history of how this was created, both the compensation plan, the details, and the policy itself were created at the same time. They've been housed together throughout up until now. So again, this would just be take out the or, or lift out, if you will, the high-level strategic goals of the plan, have that be reflected in the two pages, and incorporate by reference this plan document concept, which is, in fact, just a, a conversion of the existing policy. So that's the concept that I wanted to offer up for consideration and feedback for the committee today and get your thoughts and direction. Mr. Boykin. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the concept. My one concern that I expressed before, and I think it's not a huge concern, it's just when compensation committee items come that refer, uh, you know, I, I just think the 49 pages or whatever should be easily accessible. We have sort of a complex policy, and I find myself referring to it a lot because I can't hold it all straight in my head, the mechanics of the compensation yeah. policy. So as long as it's easily accessible and maybe referenced by hyperlink, when we need to refer to it, that'd be fine. Yeah. That's a Ms. Dillon? I, I agree with um, Grant, and, and what I was thinking as you were speaking is that I think, and I could be totally wrong, that we've had a conversation like this in other committees, and we created an appendice so that adding, having our the, the policy manual, and then having an appendix that would 
house documents that are tied to the policy mm -hmm. um, might be a way to, to keep them together and a, a good place to house it. But we are going to want to electronically, and we're going to want to hyperlink. We want that type of thing. Um, and I, I do have a kind of a meat and potatoes question, so I don't know if it's something to ask now or if I should just ask Cassandra because there's a percentage in here that surprised me. And I know we're just talking about format. So, Amy, when would be a good time to ask that question? You can, yeah. well, now I want to know. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, since Cassandra wants to know, I would say let's, uh, let's have you point that out. Uh, ideally, uh, in terms of process, we would want to send this to the compensation, want to have you send this to the compensation committee for a full review of substance. So that would be the next stopping point. But please. Uh, All righty. Uh, board governance 32. Mm -hmm. It's the first paragraph. So we're talking about um, these are positions that the board doesn't set salary. Right. Well, you said the salary, but but the um, movement of, of salary within the ranges is delegated to the CEO and CIO. Okay. In conversations that we've had, the percentage has been not more than 10%. This is 12 and a half. That, that's no. relative to the CEO and CIO. Yeah. Correct. I, just the 10% is only on the two? Said, yeah, the factually. That it's, would, yes. Yeah, we've had that related to those two positions. Yeah, that's bullet number two on um, board governance 31 at the yeah. bottom. Right. Yeah. But for others other than the CEO and CIO, it's 12 and a half. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's what you decided one day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, what we decided one day, we could decide differently on another. It just seems strange that there's two different numbers. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a perfect discussion for another committee day. where it's okay. agendized. Thanks. <laughs> I, I do appreciate you pointing that out. I would tell you that as we designed this shorter, shorter restructured version that we scoured the current policy numerous times to ensure that there was nothing that contradicted what you currently have. That's an important step along the way with this, which is why we would suggest the Compensation Committee look at it as well. But now contradictions stand out more. <laughs> to use those That's words. correct. That's <laughs> correct. Potentially. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Well, this is an information item, first reading. Um, if there's no motion, I think we'll let it just come back at the next meeting, unless people, someone would like to make a motion to take action at this time. <laughs> That's, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's so actually the ask. If, right, uh, we if, if, the, if the concept is, at least the concept is acceptable to you to move on, pass on to the comp committee to consider and discuss, then that's the way we would, uh, if we get that direction from you, then that's we would do probably that. most appropriate. Yeah, then they yeah. would digest the content. Ms. Hendricks? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. Do we, make a, do we have to staff. make a motion to do that? Or can we just direct staff, staff to move we, it to you, comp? You give us direction. It's, a, um, it's an information item, and we'll just put it on the uh, comp committee okay. agenda. Right. For Chair will week. direct staff Perfect. to bring this before the compensation committee for consideration and further review. Okay. Thank you. We'll do. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Agenda item seven, review of information requests. I don't think there was anything specific. There was a, lots of requests for educational information, <laughs> which we will definitely <laughs> capture. Agenda item eight, draft agenda for the next committee meeting, which will be in April. Uh, that's an information item. No comments? I, I think we're, there are some changes. Based upon your actions today, yes, we'll, 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 be make, some we'll make some changes based, based upon, upon your today. actions. Agenda item 8A, opportunity for statements from the public. Is there anyone who would like to make a statement? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. And I would you like to start at 425 or go all the way to 430 for the 425. 425 for the
the uh, Compensation Committee. Thank you.